everyone. How do you have a healthy sex life? If you've suffered from a sexual trauma, how do you heal that? What's tantric sex? What's sexual reflexology? What are love languages? What if I'm speaking the language of I love you, I love you, I love you, and my fiance shows his love by building things? How would we reconnect and work through that? We're going to talk about all that good stuff tonight. Super excited as always. So in tonight's Get Off the Couch segment, waiting for our... Here we go. We need our sound effects. Oh, he's slow on the go tonight, our producer. Thank you. On our Get Off the Couch segment. There we go. Because you know that my goal is to get you action and moving. I want you to review this week, where are you compromising? And I don't mean that compromising, like if you're in a relationship and your fiancé needs the freezer on the bottom and you like the, the refrigerator that's two side by side. I want you to look at where are you compromising from your soul? Because that's what you need to be especially careful from. I'm a recovering people pleaser. And let me tell you, it's very hard and I struggle still with wanting to please everyone, making things right. I got a cranky email today and I've offered a compromise, but that didn't affect me from a soul level. I said, hey, here's what I'm willing to do. And, you know, the other person really wasn't open. I wanted to give them a choice, but I still had to honor what my soul was saying. My soul was saying, you were honorable, you came from integrity, you need to respect that. So if someone's pushing you, I want you to examine where have you compromised that maybe you shouldn't have and honor that. Remember, it's very important to respect and honor yourself. Okay, I'm going to tell you about tonight's guest, who's an awesome trooper. She's up at 2 a.m. her time. It's Miss Annie Day (laughs) from England. She is the owner of Heaven Sent Bliss. She's been a therapist for several years and has studied many healing disciplines, including aromatherapy, crystal therapy, Egyptian cecum, essences, health kinesiology, reflexology, Reiki, seashell healing, sex therapy, Swedish massage, and tree spirit healing. She's also studied psychology and practices as a stress consultant. As a holistic therapist, she utilizes her skills and experience to develop a totally unique program tailored to each individual. Annie believes in the power of prayer. This coupled with each discipline brings about the most healing benefits. She also believes healing is enhanced when the patient takes an active part in their own healing process. Welcome, Annie. Good evening, Julie. How are you? Fantastic. We're so excited to have you back on again. And Annie's been on our show before, and you can check out uh, her previous interview, which I know you have a link on your site, and it escapes me at the moment. We talked about crystals, but it was in October last year. Yes, that's right. So we can put a link up for that. But let's get started. Sexual health and healing. There's so much about that. What would you say are the keys to having a healthy sex life? Um, I think it's really important to have open and honest communication. I think we need to make space for our relationship in our busy lives. I think we need to honour the importance of dressing up and fantasies and keeping your relationship fresh and alive. I think it's important for us to spend time to send our loved one a, a love letter each day. I think it's really good to engage with tantric sexual practice and Taoist lovemaking techniques. And I really think it's so important to engage with the primary love languages um, and making the time and the space um, to allow yourself to experience romance and passion as you did in the early days of your relationship. So I think all of those elements um, lead to a really happy and healthy sex life. Uh, I love that. So let's dig a little deeper because you just, in that short summary, gave us a lot of things to look at. So first, let's talk about open and honest communication because that sometimes, you know, I personally think that your sex life is kind of a good measure for your overall relationship. But Absolutely. sometimes for people, and it could, you know, we'll get into it a little later, maybe about if they've suffered sexual abuse in the past, Sure. But how is it, maybe, you know, we can have opus and honest communication about paying the bills or the kids or whatever it is, but how do we work to build that open and honest communication in our sex lives? Um, something that Terry and I do on a regular basis is um, we were part of Worldwide Marriage Encounter for about five, six years, and then we were also part of Retroval, which was an organization, a charity that helped 
marriages in crisis. Part of what they ask you to do um, is on perhaps alternate days or twice a week that you write your partner a love letter on something that you want to know more about. So you could pose the question of um, what was my strongest feeling today and then talk about that. If there's been some sort of issue in your relationship, some sort of contentious issue, then again, you perhaps use that. So some of the questions that we've used in the past that have really um, gained momentum and helped us to learn more about each other and to find out what we're really experiencing rather than just the minutiae of our daily lives. Then we've said um, in our dialogue letters to each other, um, what do I need to say or do right now to enhance our relationship? And just because you write for 10 minutes a love letter to your beloved um, and you write down very honestly, you take ownership for what you've written. So if you imagine that you're in front of someone and you need to tell them and speak your truth, and you talked very openly about this at the beginning of the program. Um, so if you were in front of me and I wanted to say something to you that um, might be um, received contentiously, if I saw that when I started to speak about it, you were defensive or I didn't think you were receiving it very well, I might dilute or not say any more about it. But actually, just the fact that you've written down your honest feelings as a love letter makes you take ownership. And once it's on that paper, it's a gift to your partner with your love and your honesty in. And then so what you do is you would pass it to your partner and say, this is my gift to you. And they would read it with once with their head, once with their heart. Once you'd actually done that and you'd looked at each other's love letters and you'd read them, then you'd spend 10 minutes just talking about what your strongest feelings were or asking for more verification or asking for more information. But certainly for us, we find that when we dialogue like that on a regular basis, there is no room for miscommunication. There is no room for misunderstandings because we're in a very congruent place with each other. We have a question here for you, Annie, on chat, and I want to remind everyone, I'm monitoring the chat room. If you have a question for Annie, you can chat it, or you can call 919-518-9773 or Skype Computers 2K Voice. Bowler1 says, I have been faithful to my partner for 15 years, and I want to explore someone new. I love my partner and don't want to split up. We have done everything sexual, everything, costumes, role plays, but I'm bored. What would you say to Bowler1? I would suggest that perhaps find another partners. Um, I've been married for 37 years and I completely appreciate that there are times when um, it's just not doing the trick. And rather than find another partner, I'd um, encourage you to explore your relationship with the partner that you've got. So um, maybe some of the stuff that you might want to try would be Tantra or Taoist lovemaking techniques that perhaps you haven't visited for a while. Um, and I'd also thoroughly recommend a book um, which is written by Dr. Annie Sprinkle called Spectacular Sex. I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to write the title down. So, yeah, and so it's Annie could... Sprinkles. Okay. Um, and what she does is um, the, the title is called Spectacular Sex and it's Make Over Your Love Life with one of the world's great sex experts. And it's Annie Sprinkle, who's a PhD. What's unusual about this lady is she was um, a sex worker first in her teens. Then she became a porn star and then she did um, a PhD in human sexual behaviour. So actually, her book has really practical advice about how to reignite that passion, how to reignite the romance, and some really unusually um, beautiful ways of actually reconnecting and getting back to the person that we fell in love with originally. And I think so much of our daily life is spent in being busy and doing things that we have to do to, to remain in the modern world that we live in and to be part of the business world. And sometimes our 
love life and our passion and our sexuality is put on a back burner. So I'd very much recommend her book. Um, I'd also recommend looking at your primary love languages as well, because it may just be that the reason that you don't feel um, passionate and loved by your partner is because they speak a completely different language. Would you like me to, to continue with explaining the primary love languages? I want to get into that, but actually not now because we've got a follow-up okay. question from Bowler, but, you know, I, that's important. Um, Bowler yeah, sure. says, what do you think about partner swaps and open marriage? And I'm really curious what you think about that and because to me this almost kind of ties into tantric sex because, you know, when I was researching this before having you on, it's not just about the actual lovemaking. It's about looking in one another's eyes and Absolutely. and things of that yeah. nature. And I think when you're connected at, at that point, then you're going to want to be with that person you love. But what, what yeah. are your thoughts about partner swaps and open marriage? Because I'm um, in the fourth year of a Master of Science degree in sexual and spiritual healing, um, I actually worked at Porterbrook Sex Clinic for three months, which is the most prestigious sex clinic in the UK, and is based in Sheffield. And one of our lunchtime seminars was done by a lady who had done a PhD called Swings and Roundabouts, which was about swinging. And actually, she gave us a really broad understanding of how swinging works, and although it's not my particular uh, bag, if you like, and it's not something I'm particularly interested in, I'm quite happy to be in a monogamous sexual relationship with my husband. I also am non-judgmental about other people who don't find that they're able to commit to that. Um, she did tell us lots of information um, that if you're going to end it, in, if you're going to begin um, a swinging lifestyle and have that very open marriage, you need to make sure that you've addressed all your issues of envy and jealousy. And what she advised people to do was for you to go for some form of psychosexual counselling before you undertook it, because she'd seen so many marriages and long-term partnerships split up because people hadn't addressed those issues before they actually went into the swinging lifestyle. What she also went on to say was that she'd been married to her husband for 25 years until he died, and that all the people that they'd had what they called recreational sex with had become their family. So um, the way that she described it was it was very respectful, it was very loving, and her husband found it particularly sexually stimulating to watch her um, being pleasured by another man. And so for them, that was part of their weekly routine, that they would go to a swinging club and he would enjoy watching her make love with another man. And she equally would enjoy seeing him with another women, woman. And when they got back together in the evening and went home to their own home, they would talk about the things that they found particularly sexually stimulating and they said that it really enriched their marriage. So um, my reasons for not being judgmental about this is um, you can't knock anything unless you've tried it and uh, I'm unable to try it in this lifetime but uh, who knows what will happen in the next one. Well, thank you for answering Bowler's question but let's talk a little bit more about tantric sex and how is it different than regular sex? And, you know, I mentioned earlier the things. It's not just about the lovemaking, but looking into one another's eyes. Oh, Tell us about that. Yeah. It's a really crucial point. Tantra is the Sanskrit word that means woven together uh, sexual and spiritual relationship with ourself um, and self-cultivation as much as with the other. Um, you could begin by facing each other um, and gazing into each other's eyes with your clothes on if you wanted to start really engaging with Tantra. Um, focus on your partner's eyes, remembering that the eyes are the gateway to the soul. Just really enjoy looking into your partner's eyes. And then synchronize your breathing. So breathe in together and then breathe out together. And just keep breathing in and out as if you were one. And then um, 
you might want to repeat this exercise while you're both naked with the woman sitting in his lap um, keep gazing into each other's eyes for as long as you feel comfortable and then kiss and caress and after some considerable time begin um, slow sexual intercourse and whenever possible again gaze into each other's eyes. Um, after practicing this for a while you'll be able to prolong your orgasm for both men and women and what Tantra um, really promotes is that um, when you're doing tantric sex it isn't just the physicality of the sex act as pleasurable as that is it's really engaging our mind our body and our spirit as well and it makes it an act of worship and an act of ecstasy exquisite ecstasy because we are actually engaging with our sexual and our spiritual nature as well and it's said that um you cannot be um a really spiritual person if you're not sexual and you can't be a really sexual person if you're not spiritual if you really want to reach your full potential you need to engage with both aspects of our human design so, Annie, I love that suggestion about, you know, keeping your clothes on and looking in your eyes, because, again, this can help people who are new to it and, and it's less threatening. Yes, of course. Now, we've got a um, question for you here on chat. And, yeah. my, and so the question is from um, Holy Okian. Should we accept our daughter's? who want to be sex workers and porn actresses, aren't these women all screwed up, victims of abuse, etc.? I'd love for you to talk about that, and I would, after you respond to that, kind of delve into um, people who have suffered from abuse, because just because you've suffered from sexual abuse doesn't mean you can't have a healthy, happy sex life. So if you can talk about that. Yeah, sure. Um, sometimes... Um... It is that if you've been sexually abused and you've been forced into being a sex worker or prostitute, whatever language we're going to use for this, then it could be that this is part of you self-harming and you coping with the sexual, unpleasant sexual experiences that you've had. And there is quite a lot of research that's been done which would suggest that... Um, particularly children's in children's home. I don't know if this is prevalent in the US, but certainly in the UK, that um, children's homes um, are targeted by paedophiles and people who would wish to groom um, boys and girls um, into um, the sex worker life. And what they do is they give them, uh, you know, lovely clothes, take them out for meals, really spoil them, spend lots of time and attention on them. And then they'll do things like um, saying, oh, I've got this friend and I owe him £30,000. And if you'll just sleep with him once, then that will wipe my debt. And once they've done it once, they get them hooked onto drugs and then it becomes almost impossible to exit that life when you're beaten or you're being drugged up continually, to actually get away from that lifestyle is incredibly difficult. Um, the choice of being a porn star, again, could be that the roots are in um, the, the person being sexually abused. It could also be that the person has um, very low self-esteem for whatever reason, and that that's why they've decided to do that. But I also know, I went to Amsterdam in December, and met a lady called Margette, and she runs a charity called um, the Prostitute Information Centre, and um, she also runs a charity for um, respect for sex workers called Bell. And I learnt from her, though, that there are lots of women who make a choice about being sex workers who actually really enjoy being sex workers and... Particularly in Amsterdam, I know that, you know, women are protected. The police will come out to them within three minutes of them pressing the alarm button. And because it's legalised prostitution, there aren't the same hang-ups about it. She was very open about the fact that she funded her PhD for herself, but for her three children, 
she funded it being a sex worker. So for me, it really changed my viewpoint on the likelihood of people just making this decision because they actually enjoy the work that they're doing. And she said to me that the chief of police was delighted that uh, prostitution was legalised because it was his experience that it reduced the amount of sexual crimes um, in Amsterdam. So, you know, it really changed my viewpoint at that time, Julie. And um, going on to um, about how um, uh, people are survivors of sexual abuse, I am myself a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And I would say that anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I think perhaps the fact that I was um, sexually abused as a child um, has helped me to be the extraordinary awesome person that I am today um, because... I've been really very blessed in receiving lots of help and support that's made me um, just really love myself for exactly who I am. And there is part of me that believes that I perhaps wouldn't be able to help people in the way that I can if I hadn't had the T-shirt myself. So although it sounds a little bit odd, um, I'm... I'm blessed that this happened to me and it gave me the life experience, but also the tools to help other people. And so I think that one of the reasons I'm so successful um, in being a sexual and spiritual healer is I do have the T-shirt for this and I do understand that it can damage your self-esteem, but it can also be incredibly empowering when you've had significant healing that's made a real difference to you and and that is the point that that I'm at now and I will admit I'm a, a work in progress as we all are. Now Annie what if there's someone out there listening who maybe has suffered from abuse can you maybe touch on the different types of ways that they could help heal that to have a healthy yeah, section sure. maybe they're single maybe they're in a relationship but what yeah. tips or advice would you have for them? I'd recommend a book called The Sexual Healing Journey. I don't know if you can see that there. Yep. And it's by a lady called Wendy Maltz, a guide for survivors of sexual abuse. Um, I can't tell you how incredibly um, helpful that book's been, but I know when I first remembered that this had happened to me, um, I actually went for counselling um, with a group called Emerge, which is based in Staffordshire, who really helped me beyond belief. Um, and I didn't actually remember that I'd been sexually abused until I was 44. So I think that uh, as a child, I'd locked that experience away because it was too challenging. And um, I just wasn't strong enough to be able to cope with remembering. So um, I became a children's worker in a women's refuge in 1998 and went on some training, and that's when I actually remembered and started to get the help. Um, I know that one of the things that was really difficult for me to cope with um, was the shame and the guilt of this happening to me, and I think um, looking for someone that is a, a psychosexual counsellor that you can go to and get some appropriate help that's going to unpack all that stuff um, because obviously, because we were children, um, this uh, experience was deeply embedded in us. So being able to have a greater understanding of it as an adult about, um, you know, what happened to you and that none of it was your fault, I know for me was completely impactive. It really made such a difference that I was not responsible for what happened to me. I was a child and um, I think it really helped me to heal um, because the way that I was counselled was there was no blame attached to anything and there was no blame attached to the other person because the counsellor that was working with me had also recognised that probably the person that had sexually abused me they were just repeating um, a pattern that had happened to them. And so that gave me a greater compassion for myself, but also for the person that had done it to me. 
Let's talk a little bit more about, I think that's great advice, and I appreciate you getting so personal and sharing your story, because I think uh, sexual abuse is a lot more common than we care to acknowledge oh, absolutely. everywhere, not just in this country, not just in Europe, everywhere. Yeah. You're what, right. yeah. what else would you say? Because I think this kind of ties together. If you've been in an abusive situation where sex has not been a positive thing, it's been a mechanical thing, just a purely physical thing. And the thing with tantric is that it's got that emotional component. You know, I'll speak for being an American. You can chime in about Europe, but I think we're in a, we have this weird dichotomy here. Like we're very sexualized and have this sexualization of these young girls on pageants. But at the same time, there's this kind of Puritan, uh, you know, prim and proper thing. I think that that dichotomy happens and that, but you don't see the love and yeah. and the emotion behind the sex. It's never portrayed that way, um, I feel, in everyday life here in this country. And so I think what Tantric does is kind of brings that back in. And besides helping the physical intimacy, what are the benefits to to a person or to a couple by practicing Tantric? I think because it does engage with our emotions, with our mind, body, and spirit, but also some of the tantric practices are really useful for um, single people. So let's say that you're a survivor of sexual abuse and you're a single woman or a single man. Some of the tantric practices and the Taoist lovemaking t- practices are about the importance of self-pleasuring and self-cultivation. And I know for me, it really changed my life when I heard masturbation called self-cultivation and um, one of the books that I'd recommend is um, The Multi-Orgasmic Couple um, by Mantachia and uh, Douglas Abrahams and Rachel Charlton and in that book they recommend that everybody um, self-cultivates every day. They recognise that if you can really self-pleasure and love yourself then you're on the healing path already. If you can honour yourself by giving yourself pleasure, then it makes such a difference. Um, But also, if you're in a couple and um, this has happened to one or either of you or both of you, then actually engaging with tantric sex can, again, just heighten that sexual experience. What tantra does, it really arouses all of the senses and one of the most beautiful tantric practices is a call awakening of the senses so what you do is you have little morsels of different types of food you have different um, sounds so you have different musical instruments you have different fabrics and textures that are very tactile so let's say um, velvet and leather and lace all sorts of lovely things some fragrances some aromatherapy oils and some drinks for you to have. And what you do is the woman is usually blindfold and then the man feeds her these delicious little morsels and then he gives her some fragrances, um, touches her with the different textures and then plays some of the musical instruments. So really by that time, before he's even touched her, all of her senses are really zinging And because you're unable to see with that blindfold on, it means it really heightens all the senses. And then you'd swap over and the woman would do the same for the man. And then by that time, all of your senses are really zinging and you gaze into the eyes of your lover. And it's just extraordinary sex. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And it really is sexual and spiritual healing. I love that. And we've got a question for you here on chat from Luther and Annie. And I want to remind you, you can chat a question. Call 919-518-9773 or Skype computer suke voice. Lutheran says, I have heard about cosmic sex. What is that exactly? Is there a physical orgasm? <gasps> You'll love it. It's great. Um, it's part of Davis lovemaking techniques. And it's uh, very much um, part of Tantra as well. So basically, um, it's said that um, when the couple are in the yab yum position, which I can probably show you with this little statue here, maybe. 
I don't know if you can see that. No, you can't. No. Oh, yes. Okay. Can you see that? Lift it up. A yeah, that was good. We can see that. Okay, let me just show you a picture. That might be easier to look at. See, we're so. good, you. We show pictures on this show. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, fairly well. Yes. Oh, if I hold it further back, that might be easy, mightn't it? Yes, that's good. Okay. That's the abyum position. You can either do that um, at the end of your lovemaking. So the woman sits inside the man's lap. She wraps her legs around him. And then you put your mouths against each other and you rock backwards and forwards and you rebreathe each other. You can do it with the man's penis still inside you. So you could do it at the beginning or the end of your lovemaking session. Or you could do it when you were done with each other and you'd both orgasmed and ejaculated. And then um, just sit into his lap and wrap your arms around each other. Again, gazing into each other's eyes and then put your mouth together and then rebreathe each other. And Mantachia, who's the um, author of The Multi-Orgasmic Couple, says that at that point in time, your spirituality makes a huge ball or a huge world and it connects with all the stars in the heavens. And I have to be honest with you, um, when I first read that, I was blown away by it. <laughs> it was lovely. And then um, Terry and I did um, a tantric sex course and learnt some Taoist lovemaking techniques and actually experienced that. And it really was literally mind-blowing it completely changed my viewpoint of how spiritual uh orgasms could be because they were combined and then they were combined with the planetary system so yeah it's very much um possible and you just need to find um a good tantric sex or Taoist love making techniques um teachers for it really which I'm sure you'll find in the U.S. Fantastic. And thanks for that question, Lutheran. Now, what is sexual reflexology? Talk, oh, tell us about yeah. that. Right. Now, where have I put it? See, isn't Annie so, great? She's, we always do show and tell when Annie's on. <laughs> I love show and tell. Um, the next book that I want to show you is called Divine Sex, The Tantric and Taoist Art of Conscious Loving. And so... Um, Basically, sexual reflexology, if you imagine that this is a penis, which clearly it's not, um, right at the tip of the penis is the heart reflex. A little bit further down is the lung. Then it's the liver, the digestive system, the kidneys. Imagine that this is a womb, which clearly it's not again. And at the very top of the uterus is the heart, then it's the lungs, then it's the liver, digestive system, kidneys. So imagine that I'm with a partner who has a problem with his heart. What we could do is we could go to the doctors and get some medication for it, or we could use... Um, a sexually healing position that would mean that all of our that both of our hearts would be together and just by um, me making sure that I was in the right position for him um, when he was doing his thrusts um, in Taoist um, lovemaking techniques you do nine shallow thrusts and then one really deep thrust and then keep doing that um, that would mean that it would stimulate his heart. So if he had something wrong with his heart and I didn't, then just by making love, I could actually make a difference to him and heal him. And um, this book, The Divine Sex, has got lots of lovely positions for healing anemia, diabetes, helping you to feel more energized, helping you with liver problems, lung problems. And again, just by being in a certain position, it can make all the difference. And these are not complicated, you know, um, positions. They're not, you don't have to be a sexual, I don't know, athlete to be able to do these positions. They're really easy to do. 
Um, one of the ones that is good for the heart is the woman just bends her right uh, leg up and so um, the man's inside her and then she just rotates her hips round so that she makes sure that his heart is actually going round her heart and gets all that really lovely heart energy. I don't know about you, but if I had a heart condition, I'd much rather go home and make love than go to the doctors. But it's your choice. Oh, I love that. <laughs> That's fantastic. And we've got a question for you on chat from Brian's Head. He says, his girlfriend's taller than he is? And if you have any suggestions for sexual positions, and love for you to answer that, but also if you in general have a book you'd recommend for that might offer problem solving for all the different combinations we might have. Yes, definitely. I would really recommend The Multi-Orgasmic Couple by Mantak Chia, Manawan Chia, Douglas Adams and Rachel Carlson. And I just got this um, about three months ago and it's called The Essential Tantra, A Modern Guide to Sacred Sexuality. And this is Kenny Thrace Stubbs, PhD. What's unusual about this is that right at the back of this book are some lovely illustrations of some tantric sex positions, which are just absolutely beautiful. Really, really beautiful, beautiful pictures that I think um, that's where I just had that image from. Um, so if your girlfriend's a lot taller than you, then clearly standing up positions aren't going to be that easy for you. Um, she could bend over and then that would give you access. Alternatively, um, she could use some of the tantra positions where the woman's lying down, the man's on is um, facing away from her. So it wouldn't matter how tall she was in, in that situation. And then um, one of the tantra positions that's really useful for any shape, size or agility is that the woman is on top of the man, the man lies on his back and she does something called around the world. So what she does is she lowers herself onto his penis and she um, decides on the pace, the rate and when she's going to move to another position. So if you imagine that the penis is a clock, she could move all the way around from 12 o'clock through all the other numbers back round again. And again, what that's doing is, is stimulating all of the penis's um, sexual reflexology points. But just as important is it's also stimulating all the woman's sexual reflexology points inside her as well. Oh, fantastic. And Lisa, we have a great comment from Lisa. Wow, I'm actually learning stuff. Love the cosmic stuff. Esai wants to know, I want to maintain an erection longer. What's the secret? Ah, right. So, again, imagine this is a penis. It's not, obviously. <laughs> it's not a penis. Um, you can do something called the finger lock. So you get your finger and wrap it around the base of your penis. And you keep pumping it. So I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, but I'm actually pumping at the base of the penis. Um, something else you can do, we kind of automatically presume that you've got to have a really rock hard, um, you know, sword of an erection. That's not true. You can actually do something called soft entry, which, again, is a Taoist lovemaking technique. So basically, the man stimulates himself or allows his partner to stimulate him orally or with her hand to get him as hard as possible. And then she make, he makes sure that she's really well lubricated, either by giving her oral sex or caressing her. And then he enters her and just the, the heat of the vagina and also the juiciness of it whilst he's doing those thrusts, can really help to make him even harder. Sometimes with men, once they've experienced erectile dysfunction once, they keep doing something called spectatorizing, which is the next time after they've been unable to get an erection or maintain it, instead of them just going, OK, this is a blank sheet and I'm now going to... Um, make love to my partner as if that had never happened they're thinking about oh my gosh supposing I don't get an erection supposing I can't keep it up supposing this and instead of actually 
um, getting what they really want, they end up manifesting what they fear, which is because they're spectatorizing, that anxiety will have an effect on their performance and their penis won't be hard. So what I do with my patients that have problems with erectile dysfunction is I help them to do the finger lock and to do some other exercises. But I also tell them that before they make love, that they're going to believe and they're going to really affirm to themselves that every thrust they do inside this person is going to make them ramrod hard. And they're going to be every thrust they do is going to get make them harder and harder and harder. And then this overrides that performance anxiety. Fantastic. Now, Annie, I wanted to, something when we had before doing the interview had talked about, you also wanted to talk about the primary languages of love. I do. So I that did, was really important. So I want you to tell us about that. And I think that that kind of goes with honest and open communication. And if we're communicating oh, better, helps with yeah. the sex life. So until, you know, we had started discussing this, I hadn't heard of the primary languages of love. So if you can tell us about that, and if I'm speaking one language and my fiance is speaking another, what can we do to communicate better? Right. So this is um, a system adapted from Gary Chapman, and um, it's called the primary love languages. And he suggests, and experience um, from myself, but other people as well, bears this out, that sometimes we don't feel loved because the other person speaks a different love language. So the primary love languages are physical touch, quality time, affirmation, gifts and presents, and acts of service. So those are the five primary love languages. So I know, because I've done a questionnaire on this um, that Gary provides us with, um, that my primary love language is quality time and physical touch. Now, let's suppose that Terry, my husband, is acts of service and um, what else? Acts of service and affirmations. So, if I'm physical touch, I will be stroking him, I'll be hugging him, I'll be doing lots of lovely things, holding his hand, because that's what I need to fill my love tank. Now, if that isn't the primary love language that he experiences and his is um, affirmations, then he will need me to say, you're wonderful. You've done a really good job of this. This is really great. You're really handsome. You're really lovely. And if that's what he needs to fill his love tank, that will work for him. But if I give him what I need, which is physical touch and quality time, it won't touch his love language at all and it won't make his love tank any higher. So um, one of the things that I'd recommend people to do is do a questionnaire, which I have a handout for um, that might be useful. And um, once you've established what your primary love languages are, we've usually got at least two that are really much stronger than the others. Um, and then once you do that, what you can do is Every night when your partner comes in, you say, so how's your love tank today? And they tell you how full it is. If it's not completely full and if it's only scoring at a 7 out of 10, then you can say to them, OK, sweetheart, so what could I do right now that would really fill your love tank? And they can tell you they need to go for a walk. They need you to affirm them. They need you to hold their hand or whatever it is. And equally, they ask you, how full is your love tank today? Out of 10. And um, you can tell them whether your love tank is full to overflowing or whether it needs some topping up. What's lovely about this system as well is it tells you the things to avoid with your partner if they have a particular primary love language. So one of the things, for instance, which is with quality um, time is um, the things to avoid with someone whose um, primary love language is quality time is not to neglect them for other people. So spending more time with uh, friends or doing other activities and neglecting your partner. So once you know the things to avoid 
as well as the things that would really enhance and really fill up that love tank. Um, the sky's the limit. And after a few weeks of doing it, it becomes quite addictive. No, what did I love that? And I want to get that book now and read that and, yeah, and figure out what. It. Yeah, I think it'd be really useful. What advice would you have for couples that have been together a long time? I mean, whether it's sexual or with language, you know, I mean, you live with someone, you see them in their robe and they're not looking good. And you, you know, <laughs> how can, what would you say to them? How to spice it up? Or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I've got a really lovely book that's really enhanced my relationship with Terry over the years. We've been together for 39 years now and uh, we've been married for 37. And this book is called How to Make Love to the Same Person for the Rest of Your Life and Love It. And it's by a lady called Dagmar O'Connor. And what she suggests is that you do really naughty things like um, you drag your husband off up the chase um, to where there's a woods and you get in the car and you make love and you snog and you kiss each other and you act like a couple of teenagers. Um, she also suggests that you set up scenarios um, where you wait till your husband gets in, you set this up before he gets in and you tell him that um, what you want to do is pretend that you're having an affair together. So you say, OK, come upstairs really quickly. And you go and you make love really fast and really urgently and really passionately because you're in a short time frame when the alleged husband is going to come back again. She tells you to do all sorts of things like dressing up. She tells you to um, find unusual places to go to to make love. Really things that might be a little bit outside of your comfort zone, trying some BDSM practice. You know, most people um, have engaged with Fifty Shades and have a little bit of an understanding about that. Anything that's going to really push you a little bit out of your comfort zone is going to be quite exciting. What you don't want is for sex to be boring. So the more you can add spice to it, the more you can try unusual things, the more you can go outdoors and make love. Be in the sea and make love. Be at the top of a mountain and make love. All of these are different opportunities um, of actually really engaging with that. And um, I'd fully recommend trying fantasies. And the whole beauty of fantasies is that we can just explore them with each other rather than going outside of our um, you know, relationship, whether that's a, a marriage or whether it's a committed relationship so I really feel quite strongly that um, everybody who's been in a relationship for a couple of years ought to get Dagmar O'Connor's book because it's just absolutely wonderful and inspiring she suggests that you, you drag your partner into the shower or you jump in the bath with them when you've got clothes on and do all sorts of mad lovely exciting stuff that really takes you out of the realms of mundane sex Ah, lovely. I'm glad that we're recording this interview because I will be definitely listening to this again because <laughs> I, I have to kind of pay attention so I can't absorb it all. But if you have a question for Annie, feel free to chat at 919-518-9773 or Skype Computers 2K Voice. Now, Annie, at what point, I think you've given us great information and tons of wonderful suggestions, but at what point do you think a person or a couple needs to see someone like you, a sex therapist and, you know, spiritual healer, what has to happen in the relationship that, the, you know, these books are great, but then they're going to need to take it to the next level to work sure. with you? What Can you give some, maybe some examples of people you've yeah, worked sure. with or situations that would help? Yeah. Um, I've been recently working with a couple that have been married for 10 years They've got two small children. They've got one teenage child. And uh, to be honest, they were finding it really difficult to just make the space and the time to enjoy each other. And they realised that they'd sort of gravitated into making love very infrequently. And it had become chore-like. So they were doing it as one more job to tick off the box. 
And so at that point, when they realised how much their relationship had deteriorated because of the busy pace of their life and having young children and a teenager who doesn't always want to go to bed and they need some privacy, that was the point at which they accessed sexual and spiritual healing. So we managed to help them to explore what they both really like, to set up some really... um, you know, a couple specific um, activities that they could be doing, but also setting up some um, really good support networks because they what they really needed was reliable babysitters and someone to take care of the teenager as well. Um, so they had the opportunity to be together. Now, that's a quite common scenario that people realise that they want to reignite the passion and the romance of their early years together, and that the the busyness of our lives has actually destroyed that and deteriorated it. And once people have realised how awful it's got, usually it's been quite cataclysmic. So people have had really bad arguments, and they they you know have thought about divorcing or ending the relationship in some way. That's when usually it motivates them to come and get some help. Equally, um, anybody who has a problem with um, erectile dysfunction um, is one of the most um, common ones, particularly because we are in such a, our modern lives are often quite stressful and that obviously has an impact on men um, completely, but also on women as well. So anybody who is finding um, that they've got a sexual problem of some kind would it, it would enhance... Um, their healing if they came to somebody like me. Um, Also, what I can do is just help people to um, enhance their sexuality. I've been working with quite a few people recently who want to come out of the closet about being transgendered, transvestite, bisexual, lesbian, gay, and just really need some emotional and psychological support as well as some practical help in how they're going to manage coming out. Because, as we all know, not everybody um, receives this information in a helpful way. Sometimes people, families aren't particularly helpful when they disclose their sexuality. And so part of what I do for people is to help them feel as robust and coherent with what they're doing um, and to manage it so that they feel really good about who they are. I actually believe that our sexual identity is as unique as our fingerprints. And the more I see people um, who need to have help from me, the more I'm becoming completely convinced. I no longer believe that any of us are just heterosexual, just bisexual, we're just one thing. We're a combination of so much more than that. Absolutely. Now, I'm curious. I've read, because actually when I used one of your blogs to post on the site about your interview, you said, you know, I'm not a sex surrogate. What do you think about sex surrogates? Do you think that those can be beneficial? I do indeed, yeah. There's been a lady in the UK that a friend sent me a link across from, and um, she's a sexual surrogate, and she has specialised for, I think, over 20 years, if memory serves me right, um, in actually providing sexual surrogacy for disabled people who were would have been unable to have had a sexual relationship because they were paralysed, paraplegic, they were disabled in some way. And there were so many affirmations and testimonials for the work that this lady had done as a sexual surrogate that I don't think anybody should be judgmental of her at all. I think it's a really valid and important service. It's not It's not what I do, but um, I completely acknowledge that there is a time and a place for this. And um, I actually know um, someone that used to go to a sexual surrogate and is a disabled man who said that it was for him it was a really loving beautiful, very respectful um, therapy. So, yeah, I'd completely recommend it. Fantastic. Now, there are a couple questions I like to ask all guests. The first is, you know, someone might be struggling right now. It doesn't necessarily have to 
be, say, if they're struggling in a sexual life or in a challenging relationship, might have had a divorce, lost a job, they're just really in a tough place. What words of encouragement or advice would you have for them? I would say to really get in touch. Sometimes we forget that we've all got a guardian angel and I would suggest that we call in our guardian angel. Quite often we feel alone and we don't feel as if our guardian angels are there for us. And the the thing is that the guardian angel won't jump in um, and do something for you because it would mean breaking your will. So um, what I would recommend anybody to do is call in your guardian angel and say, I really need some help with either just one aspect of my life or lots of aspects of my life. But certainly I'd call in my guardian angel straight away and ask them for help with every aspect because there is nothing that the angels can't help you with. I love that. I have angels all over our house and <laughs> truly appreciate that now. We were a little slow on the go tonight on our uh, sound effects, but the other question, you know, I'm all about getting people off the couch. <laughs> so what advice would you have if there's one thing, Annie, that they could do right after the show, that they could do before bed or tomorrow morning when they wake up to reawaken their brilliance, what action would you recommend? I'd recommend self-cultivation. I would recommend <laughs> We've got all sorts of sound effects here. Amnon <laughs> likes to have fun. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd recommend self-cultivation daily. Give yourself the self-love that you so deserve because if you can love yourself, then you can allow someone else to love you as well. I, and you really love them as well. I think that's tr that's so true. I found on my other half when I finally learned how to love myself and it's on to the next 5,000 lessons I have for this lifetime. Now, Annie, <laughs> first of all, I want you to shout out, give a shout out to your village because there's a group that's joining you in the middle of the night. So first of all, give them a shout out. Thank you very much to Claire and all the gang and Karen and um, all of you for staying up at this ungodly hour and listening to me talk about sexual and spiritual healing. But not only that, for being so awesome in our class tonight and telling me how brilliant I was going to shine tonight because I really needed to feel that. And uh, your love for me and your encouragement has been really tangible tonight. So thank you so much to all of you. And then There you go. See, we got it all. He's coming out with all the sound effects tonight. Now, Annie. It's great. <laughs> Tell us where we can find out more information about you, if you have any classes or workshops. Tell us all that good stuff. Okay, so you can have a look at my website, which is www.heavensentbliss.co.uk. And on there you'll find Sexual Spiritual Healing. It has an explanation of how I work as a sexual and spiritual healer. And it also explains that you're able to access sex therapy from me via Skype. So you don't have to live in the UK for you to have sexual and spiritual healing from me. We can actually do it by Skype really successfully and it works beautifully. Fantastic. We've got that heavensentbliss.com.uk, which I've written down here. Check yep, out our .co.uk. Yep, .com.uk. No, got .co. Oh, .co.uk. Yes, that's it. Oh, yeah. my fault. I'll rewrite okay. that. Okay. So, sorry, .co. sometimes your accent throws me a little bit. So Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so it's all good. So we've corrected that. And I want to thank you, Annie. And we have another great interview with Annie uh, where she talks about crystals. We learn lots of good stuff on that. So feel free to check that out. That's in the archives with a lot of other wonderful stuff. So thank you, Annie, for being a real trooper and getting up in the middle of the night. As always, a pleasure. <laughs> we'll definitely got you, get you on here for something else and figure it out. But as always, I learned a ton and I'm most appreciative. Thank you. My pleasure. Very much my pleasure. Thank you. And to all our viewers, look, the next Get Off the Couch online workshop is happening. It's time to find your passion. So, again, interactive class. We've got three national and passionate experts. So if you're a clock watcher, you hate Monday mornings or counting out the days, 
world would be such a better place if we all were following and living our passion. I've reduced the price, a special promotional price of $20. There's no excuses to not get off the couch and find your passion. Look here on the events page and you'll find out more information. June 18th, I want to see you there. And if all of Annie's Village there in the UK, it's all good. You get to review the class for up to seven days. So if you can't make it live, you can learn all good stuff. All right, everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you later. Bye now. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha,